11 of the festival. Um, and it's been incredible to, to really feel the energy of all the artists here. And um, it's been great to sort of just have all the audiences sort of uh, be here with us. And so I would like to introduce to you um, this project that we've been doing uh, with CultureBot five, six years ago. Um, and really it came out of a, a, a need or a desire to have more context uh, for the work that we're doing, just to start a few conversations, so it's not just a one way between uh, with, with the art uh, to, to the audience, just to have a little bit of context and have artists of the festival and of New York just to start having a conversation with the work, with the audience, with the moment now. And so, uh, without further ado, saying that, um, I'm going to introduce to you uh, my good friend Andy Horowitz, who's been who is the founder. Um, of CultureBot and uh, just landed a new exciting gig, which I'm so excited and proud of him for. He's the new director of programs at the Skirball Cultural Center in Los Angeles. So, uh, uh, LA is very, very lucky. The West Coast is very lucky to have him. And me, I'm going to West Coast too. Yeah. Uh, but, um, uh, and just want to say that CultureBot is one of the, the rare uh, unicorns of. Um, theatrical and critical writing uh, in the field, so we're very happy to be partners with them this year. So, Andy. Okay. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, so, do you ever get a program on the streets? No. Yeah, I kind of was looking around, it's like I didn't see a lot of them. So, uh, <laughs> like half so he's going to personally hand it up. <laughs> I'm going to get this going up this side. Just because that'll help uh, explain. Uh, this is Marianne, Shannon, Lars, Andrew. Um, I'm gonna get to the young lady at the end, um, just super quickly. So I started CultureBot in 2003. We launched in December of 2003. At PS122, it was possible because we applied for an NPN grant that Mark Russell encouraged us to apply for. Um, yeah, and he, he made it possible. He, he was willing to take a risk on a you know, I'd only been there for a year, and and, and out of all this, um, you know, the ensuing past 12 hours we were happening. Um, since I moved into the West Coast in August of 2014, um, I realized it was time for, to bring in new people for CultureBot to continue for a new generation in a different way. So first, I want to introduce, um, over here, we have, <laughs> Um, we have Lydia Mokdesi uh, uh, and Dan O'Neill, who are the dance and theater editors, and Ben and Sarah. So this is the new sort of leadership of the Culture Not team. I encourage you to come over and meet them and introduce yourselves and get involved. And then Eva Pleskin uh, is also part of that team, and she has been absolutely amazing in organizing this conversation that we're about to have. So I'm going to turn it over to her. I'm going to be here to enjoy and have fun, but uh, uh, I'm gonna uh, take it away. So today we're convening around the ideas of dramaturgy and media, and I do this maybe with that. Um, but just so everyone knows, Lars and Andrew have a show at one o'clock. So we're gonna start um, with some questions that are gonna direct the way into your practice, and then we'll move on. But they're all they're all related. So something that came up just a minute ago was this idea of using technology to do the impossible or having an impossible problem to solve, um, and especially in the way you do that in theater. Um, and I wonder, Lars and Andy, you guys started or you started the cue, the piece that we have here under the radar with this idea of solving an impossible problem in terms of relating one to the other. Sorry, can I just add, you're all used to using microphones, but uh -huh. you're not. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. So can you talk about solving impossible problems as a starting point for using media in your theater practice? Yes, I've prepared an answer. <laughs> By the way, here's, here's the book that we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. uh, we saw it for the first time. It's, it's, really it's, it's, Marianne is the founder of the of Builders Association, and Shannon is the co-author of the book with them. And Lars is holding it. And, Lars is holding it. <laughs> and Andrew is supporting Lars. Uh, so, uh, 
much. And just, just to be clear, so everybody understands. I can hold it if you want, or we can put it I like it. It makes me feel a little safe. It makes me feel a little safe. Maybe there's something inside that I can say, possibly. Um, yeah, impossible problems. Well, it's really hard. I guess, you know, the hardest thing about the theater is that you go to different places and there's different people and you can't do what you do in cinema, which is cut. And so, or not exactly, like you actually just stay in the room together. And so you have to um, find ways to cut and change and to transform and change. And technology is one, human bodies do that too. And so the actors actually in the Institute of Memory do that quite a bit, very quickly. Um, that's one kind of technology, circulatory system kind. Um, I guess, other than that, I find, um, other, than, other than the fact that it's just important. It's important in this particular piece um, to try to like vivify all the different technologies that are related to. It's, it's a story that's called the Institute of Memory. It's it's an excavation of my father's past. It's a one o'clock girl invited. <laughs> um, but part of the part of my interest in working in the project is that I didn't know very much about him. He was quite opaque as a person, and once I started doing research into him, I realized there was all these analog technologies that. Um, that sort of bounced off him and that he invaded in various ways and he just barely transitioned into the sort of digital realm. Um, and, I, and I was, as I was, I was just thinking about uh, analog technologies versus digital technologies and how that's changing how privacy works and remembering works and bringing those two things into the, and, and so I needed to bring sort of that theme or that transference into, into the project somehow, expressively. So like, that's what the world is doing, is making that transition. How to, make a pro how to actually bring the tactility. My dad used to handwrite letters to me. He used to type letters to me. They were all fucked up because he didn't have, you know, white out and like double X's over words that needed to be deleted. So they were like these really strange, like self-reacted pieces. They looked like, they looked like intelligence transmissions because, because he was rephrasing things and crossing things out. And he always, pretty much always, started a letter that was typed and then would continue rather than just like shooting off an email, I'd get like a week of thought onto the same piece of paper and thinking about that as an artifact. So how is a, how is a performance the same thing? Um, because I started writing and you start working on something and there's some early ideas that come up in a rehearsal room. And some of those ideas, which are really early, make it all the way to the audience. And most of them die. And then some of the audiences, some, some of the ideas, um, you know, come up, we're, we're still adjusting our show, actually. We like made some changes yesterday. Are, are much much newer, and so how do these like really new ideas, like this very new legacy of an idea, come in relationship to this old idea as an artist? And the audience doesn't know which, what was born when, and so we're trying to mediate. Um, it does. I don't know if that entirely answers the question, but it just well, it brings up the, an analog digital. It brings up another thing. Yeah. You're yeah. dealing with like you know an element of technology in your piece, and you want to adjust it. Like how do you how do you manage that in terms of like technically what you're working with? Like if you're trying to implement new technology, but you're the ideas of it. What do you mean by the ideas? Like if you're making a conceptual or like content shift in the work, but you have this technology that's supported in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, I, I want to sort of maybe expand or amplify on that question. Um, you mentioned archive and sort of, and, and the process of writing the book was going through archives. And there's this question about, and of course you've been making this work since 92. So, um, did I hear a, almost an applause there? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so the evolution of technology has actually been encompassed in your body of work, and also this this negotiation of archive as and process as performance. So, I'm wondering, listening, you know, tell us a little bit about yeah. your perspective yeah. of your work. Well, I was um, just thinking about a very pragmatic example of that, which is that when I started going through material for the book, I was horrified to find in the back of our storage unit like laser discs and three quarter inch tape and cassettes. Does anybody remember the cassettes? Okay, video cassettes and um, what are those things called? Yeah, tape, those sound those sort of set. Yeah. So um, that was just yeah. like so incredible because I do remember making a show and it just being like an endless process of saying like, okay, can you cut that or make this image? And it would take, they'd be like, come back tomorrow. And now, obviously, you can render anything and cut anything in a matter of seconds, and so that kind of malleability can happen in rehearsal. But it's uh, you know it's been a long road, a long road, sad road, <laughs> 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 and a triumphant one too. I, I on the impossible problem thing, it just it does seem like one of the impossible problems is about this sort of how to make how to how to really feel 
feel and think in a complicated way about the analog digital relationship, or the online offline relationship. And it seems to me that that's a big problem or a big interesting puzzle. And it does seem that the theater as this historically analog format, uh, at, you know, offering itself as a laboratory for making strange the digital. It's the, uh, and sort of making it felt and in a different way, uh, or exposing its component parts or its operations in a different way. That it seems to me both the show I saw last night and, and so many of the shows that I've been uh, uh, archiving or analyzing to make that book. It, it seems to be that 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 is one thing that <coughs> kind of runs as a through line, um, through line through a lot of this work. <coughs> I mean, I think it's useful to talk about technology as a category, but for me, thinking about making work, it's become a hindrance in thinking about technology as a thing that I'm like using or doing, because like, you know, we have fire and we have words and, you know, we have lights and yeah. So I, I try not to approach it as a, anything else. And it even goes into like, well, am I making dance or am I making theater or am I making poetry? It's like, it doesn't, it's not helpful anymore to have those, um, to talk about it in those uh, uh, ways. For me, personally, I like, obviously wouldn't be here if we didn't have those structures to talk about it. Um, and I guess it's just a constant negotiation. Of like, well, these, this stuff is around. Um, I think most of like new technology that is on stage is only new to the theater because the theater doesn't have a lot of money and can't be at the forefront of technological innovation. So like, for me, just like making stuff in my apartment or uh, like hacking a typewriter or something, it's just like, and, and back to the thing of doing the impossible, it's like, well, I don't have the money to do it, so how do we get it done? And that, and that first step of like, I have an idea to do something, I don't know how to do it, it's usually like, uh, there's a byproduct to it, or, or like there's an interesting bit that you didn't think was gonna happen, and then it just like, kind of snowballs from there. That maybe didn't answer your question, but. Well, no, because I think about both, everyone is kind of talking about the analog digital thing and this sort of weirdness of now using the word technology to sort of fetishize a specific new idea of aesthetic. And, you know, um, there's this book by um, Bert Oates, it's called um, Great Reckonings in Small Rooms on Phenomenology of Theater, and it's really the title that I really like. Um, and, um, you know, and he talks about the introduction of the chair as this radical technological innovation. Um, because the idea that one would have a chair, a real object in real life on stage, was radically disruptive. Um, so, so, it's, so, part of the, so part of what's fascinating is that you, this is a long, long, long conversation. Um, and um, maybe this is a chance to talk about the term that you are using mediaturgy, mm -hmm. in a sense, to sort of try and forge some new languages, or, or, or at least be more flexible in the words we use. <laughs> so, uh, unpack that a little for us. Well, I mean, I think that it is a, there's a long kind of wandering epilogue in the book that's called mediaturgy, and um, just to follow on what Andrew's saying, I think that that really it comes from. If you start with an idea, you have to decide what the idea calls for. And basically everything springs from that. So formally, if you're talking about, you know, this a layer of reality and escape that is, you know, the Wizard of Oz, then, then you end up making like a layer of augmented reality that people can use in their phones in relation to the liveness on stage. But it's not as if we started out saying like, what tech can we use to express this? It really is about the, just taking the tools that are grounded in dramaturgy. There has to be a reason for it to be there. Otherwise, it does just feel like technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, one of
one of the um, one of the you know Lars, yours is a personal story, but it's a it's a seeking to find the answer to this. Um, I, I, this phrase that has been coming up a lot for me is, is inquiry based. Mm -hmm. That that not you're not necessarily setting out to tell a story specifically. That may be part of it, but each thing starts with a question. Is that a, and, and somehow that feels related to this mm -hmm. this very um, small C Catholic use of, of new mm -hmm. tools. Can you can do you feel that that's a how does that resonate? Um, how about an association? Okay, is that cool? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Also, yeah. Bordeaux States said that you should never have children on stage. Really? He didn't quite say that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's, 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 it gets really distracting. <laughs>
young daughter on his phone, and everyone said, well, that's years away. Nobody's ever going to be able to use video on their phone. <laughs> and then the iPhone came out you know, six months later. So I think that kind of like, again, it's just looking for what you need and then finding that tool. And then, of course, other people in the culture are looking for that tool as well. But I want to pick up on storytelling because I think it's, you know, writing, writerly techniques, traditional playwriting, storytelling, a lot of the work that people on this stage can make, in many ways, like, challenges that, or it uses those things in ways that question that. I mean, um, it questions traditional notions of fixed identity, like that a character has to be the same person all the time. Um, and, and I don't know, did anybody see Andrew Schneider's You Are Now Here, You Are No Way, or whatever last week? story was. Um, so, I mean, I guess the, the question is, um, is there, is, is, you know, how concerned are you really with, like, straight on narrative stories, or is there a, a, an expanded notion of what story is to you? I'm just going to talk about me, because that's late. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, um, I, I'm a really bad storyteller, and I don't really have stories I want to tell, but I have experiences that I want to share with people, and I'm really just fascinated in moments and cutting up the whatever was before and whatever was after. It's just like, how did we get here right now? Um, and so I think that I use the way that I make work is just like this experience, and then I go, and then I just there's a central thing, and then it expands with these tendrils out in every. Uh, and I was realizing as I was sitting here is that you use new technology, and I don't. I don't think I like I use lights and sound. I don't think, I don't, yeah. Arduinos and networking interactivity. Yeah, but that's just because I can't afford to hire like, people <laughs> that sound cute. That's not true. That's not true. But that's, that's what's amazing. No, 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 it's not true. It's not true. It's, it's, it's because it's very, it's because it needs to be hyper precise. And, exactly. And, yeah. and a precision that, uh, that can't be achieved through people actually hitting that. Exactly. Um, yeah. So yes, yeah. it, is a, it is a problem solving technique uh, using but that's all behind the scenes. Using poverty and precision. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's actually a really interesting thing. Is like because a lot of art, you know, and I hate the word innovation, but, um, fucking capitalism. But um, <laughs> but um, a lot of artistic stuff happens because you don't have tools and you got to have it. You know, whether it's hip hop in the Bronx in the '80s, you know, you know, sampling things and DJs because it's cheaper than getting a bunch of instruments or like it's the technology the tools that are available to you. So in a way, you know, you, you know it's, it's... Can I say something about your story ask, your storytelling question? Yes, please. We ended up using, throughout the book, uh, there's, it, it's divided, it goes across a lot of different performances and uh, every chapter uh, focuses on different elements of a different show. But we use this word storyboard to talk about, to some, somehow talk about what I think you're talking about. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think that there is something about um, moving from, let's say, dramaturgy framework to a mediaturgy framework that uh, kind of places narrative in a different space, sort of as material to be mined and redistributed um, in ways that make certain kinds of playwrights uncomfortable. Mm. And one of the really interesting, uh, fun uh, sort of themes throughout the builder's work was you know, trying to the attempt to find writers who were okay with this idea, <laughs> okay with the idea that they would provide text for distribution, <laughs> you know, um, which is a much different process than than some writers want to be part of. Yeah. I wonder how that extends to sort of like other collaborative elements because it's uh, something that comes up a lot in the builders' work is these um, joining of vocabularies and practices with things you wouldn't necessarily consider a theatrical kind of artist, like architecture, or even early on, like computer programming, or you know, using these, um, using the, the there's a, a point that you make that this sort of intermedia is a revelation of the similarities therein, rather than the distances between them. And I, and I know you guys work a lot with very many different kinds of artists. Um, so I wonder about, 
how you approach those collaborations and how you find common languages and if there's certain you know synergies that you find or just difficulties that you encounter. Yeah, it's fundamentally is just vocabulary sharing. Um, and early on, early on in the development of the process, I did, I made a project called Holocene, which is a big aquarium, and I had to like work with experimental plumbers and like and hydraulic engineers and structural engineers and electrical engineers and you know aquaticists, which is like a genre of like performer. Um, and and I had to it's a very healthy in America. Um, no, but I had to uh, yeah, I, it's like it's just coming, it's, it's it's like going to a slightly different country, right? Like the, they go across the border and try to figure out how to communi communicate your idea. Not only are they not uh, different kinds of artists, actually most of them, many of them are not artists at all. They are just people who have a particular specialty who are creative. And so usually I start by talking to the community and say, I really want to make a lot of water go up and down, who can I talk to? And people will just start passing me off to other people. And eventually the same name will come up several times. Like there, there's like this one crazy person who likes to like, you know, just like, make water shoot really high in the air and like erupt, you know? <laughs> people, and then, because they have a reputation, and then and that's the person who gets excited, because if you are like a really advanced computer programmer, or you are a really advanced hydraulic engineer, we're not paying at that scale. So you've got to do it because you want to bend culture. You want to, you want to bend your thing. You, you want to, you want to bring, you know that what you, your specialty is, could be turned on and flipped, and, and become innovative in a different way, because whatever the prescription, the landscape that you work in, like I worked with a guy who, who was like part, he was in charge of like Washington DC's municipal water system for a while, for like two years. And he, he was really bored by that. And so, you know, it's like you kind of find out, that, that's how you start the conversation. And then, and then I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. So then he had to say like, well, uh, and he didn't know what I, I, I didn't know what he was talking about, he didn't know what I was talking about. So we just talked about the most general terms and exchange vocabulary, and that's how every collaboration goes still. Um, even with even with other theater artists, I mean, we're talking about a typewriter. We, we make experimental theater, but I don't know what he's thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, this is very interesting. Um, and you mentioned that you So I just so I actually I would love to hear about sort of like the evolution of that practice. I think you know expanding on what sort of Laura was talking about and in, in, in the framework of builders association. What are you guys sleeping? Oh yeah. 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 Okay, Andy's got it. Go. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you show the menu? No. No, it's across. <laughs> yeah, we're going to start talking. It's in Connecticut. It's in the Martin Center across yeah. across the building. Oh, it's not going to be until it's yeah. not going to be. It's not going to be until one. You'll have time. Yeah, you've got to like one. We're, we're doing a hard stop yeah. here at one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Andrew's got to go get a new costume and warm up. Do his vocals. I'm glad. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah. So as these people uh, wrote 
rotate up. I'm just going to ask some people in the audience who are in this company to come up because it would be great to hear what they have to say. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Mo, can you go with Mo Angelo? <laughs> Shannon is, is, is a very <laughs> important and well-recognized scholar. Um, and a huge hero of mine. Um, and it talks a lot about this, this uh, you know, the expanded art, like what expanded art practices are. And it feels like one of the things that I'm hearing across is that part of the changing nature of the artists in, in the theatrical thing, but in general, is, is, like, is about the person, and what you just described, is like actually finding the interesting thing and the other interesting things and putting them together to tell the most interesting thing, no matter what platform or discipline you're working in. Um, as opposed to like, I have this important story to tell about this. Um, and you know, this talks, you know. So I just wonder if you want to talk a little bit about, um, or what, if you don't mind, um, or if you want to, well, I was going to say like, but we've got large for a few minutes, so if you want to talk about that, Shannon, if you want to talk about that. Uh, well, well, <laughs> I don't really know what to say. I'm not sure. Um, I, I I feel like I feel like there's no rule to that. Actually, I, sometimes it starts with like a, a nifty piece of technology that makes me feel a certain way. Sometimes it's it, it, it's a it, you know sometimes it's like my dad or a conversation about my dad. Sometimes it's about like just like I'm driving and I have like a 30 second visual that I can't get out of my head for two months, and then I realize okay, well I have to like pay attention to this now, and it becomes like an artwork. So. And the way that I actually pursue and grow those teams doesn't even have a pattern. Mm -hmm. um, the only pattern is that live performance is at the center of a constellation 
um, of kind of hard works usually that, that all respond to whatever the idea might be. So um, I'm always compelled to make something live with an, with an audience, but I'm also compelled to make um, installations and video pieces and other kinds of media. And like, I, I think that set and the typewriter Institute of memory, I would like to make that evolve into a, a, a piece in an installation context that viewers can just use mm -hmm. and also take away like, use a score, like typing a letter is actually a score. Mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as a piece that relates to this, but is sort of born from it and exists in a different medium. Um, and the one thing I just want to say, like Kim, um, thanks for complimenting the actors, I think they're really good too. <laughs> and I, but there's this, this thing about storytelling that keeps coming up, and like the, 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 way, the only way that I can like make, make it make sense to me ultimately is <coughs> thinking of technology as text rather than texture. And when I see technology implemented in performance as texture, it makes me it makes me a little queasy. And when it functions as as text, just like the language, just like the acting, when there's just no distinction, as Andrew was saying, um, whatever that ineffable blending is, which is totally instinctual, and yes, blends forms and cinema, architecture, sculpture, um, in ways that I'm not even capable of articulating. I mean, the reason I, I, I wrote this piece is not because I want to be a writer. The reason I wrote this piece is that I just don't know how to communicate what these impulses are to a writer. I'm more successful at communicating with lighting designers, video designers, but I don't know how to communicate in the, in the words. The words part, I don't know how to actually, that's like the hardest for me. Um, and that's theoretically what the story is, right? But actually the arc of, of the typewriter and the sculpture is one of the stories. The arc of like a, a music sample in that piece, there's five music samples that play. The arc of that is like one of the stories. And, and sort of the acting human bodies and, and, and the voices are one of the stories. But those are all just moving in parallel. Uh, cool. It's interesting yeah. to think about how you do, I wanted to ask you, you would be interested in using the same sort of assembly, is our word today, and putting it in a different type of space, like in a yeah, gallery space or installation space, or it's something yeah. that's open all day that people yeah. So yeah. that would require a different apparatus for presenting it, mm -hmm. and a different kind of curatorial collaboration, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, different, yeah. Yeah. different yeah. staff. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, no, I, I just, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no, please, please. Oh, are you wrapping up? Wrap up. Yeah. I'm not wrapping up anything. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I did want to say just that, uh, briefly about text, because I yeah, think yeah. that that's a huge component of um, everything we've spoken about, and. Uh, sort of the resistance to playwrights and playwriting, because certainly when, you know, I still think there's a conventional structure where everyone is there to serve the writer, that the, that the writing, the text is what you begin with. But, you know, in a completely visual society, it's like show it, don't say it. And I think that the text is like the last resort mm -hmm. in terms of actually trying to get a structure together. But one of the chapters, and Rich, I think early on we were talking about one of the chapters being about all the writers that we worked with and fired. Yeah. Because it was, it's really a long road. <laughs> and there's a variety of contracts. And, you know, they ended up being like, the writer understands that their work is going to be completely torn apart and that they're willing to let us use any part of it, but not all of it, and in whatever order. And I think that that was like sort of a, you know, <laughs> desperate leap towards what really is now second nature now, which is that the text is one element of, you know, an equal element mm -hmm. in the score. Back, like, like I think that, 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 that um, I, 
I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to dig back into the book and look at that a little bit more, but I do wonder, like, like, what would it be like to enter into practice with someone who has a really rigorous, you know, like, go work with LPD on it? Mm, right. Yeah. And what would that be like for you? Terrifying. <laughs> if you don't know, she's an Robotics. Austrian feminist, <laughs> radical feminist playwright who writes these incredibly dense texts with, like, no character names, no stage directions. She just, she just puts it out there and says, do something with it. Um, and the, the results are wildly variable. Yeah. Well, listen, I mean, uh, yes, there is always a writer involved, and often people who are not playwrights. I guess that's my point. Like with Aladdin, the person who ended up writing it was the senior editor of Wired Magazine. And the Continuous City, it ended up being a filmmaker who was who wrote the script. But I think that that is central to the idea is that they they want to be in the room, but they want to be one of the people in the room, so that the material is all if there's no hierarchy in terms of what's coming first. So well, there's a hierarchy because you're the decider. Yeah, I'm the decider. <laughs> <laughs> true, very true, very true. interesting. Um, <laughs> Bring in the lighting design because they know how to do lights. 
Um, and you may not, you may listen to their thought about <coughs> where to put somebody or what to yeah, say. Right. But so I'm just curious, like over the course of the company, how have you, how have you, what, what is the nature of your collaborative practice, and how have you, how does that sort of evolved over the years? I'm going to ask a collaborator to come fill this empty chair. David Pence, can you come up here? So this is another writer. <laughs> I'm not going to answer that question. Can one of you collaborators please get on the bar? So, consensus and collaboration. Oh, we don't have consensus. I mean, that, no, no. Uh, no, that's not true. I mean, occasionally, but really, it's, uh, it's, it's um, a sketching practice, uh, as Miriam says. So many iterations, right? Everyone is in the room from the beginning. Please forgive me if I'm repeating anything that's already been said. Uh, everyone is in the room from the beginning. That means everyone. That means all the designers as well. Um, all the technicians, the actors, the writer, the decider. And, uh, you know, okay, now we're gonna try, there's this seat, we say, okay, there's this scene where um, Dorothy arrives in Oz, so. <laughs> get going, people, get going. And then there's yelling and screaming, and then, you know, something, <laughs> we bring something to the stage, a, a, a sketch, and adjust from there. I, I mean, would you agree, David? I would agree. Go ahead. I would say that it's e I find as a performer that it's easier to be told what to do. Than to have ideas of my own. Uh, <laughs> Occasionally I'll have an idea, but I was thinking when you were talking, uh, Mo, like I am, with one exception, I have only worked with the Builders Association as a, as a performer and uh, never as a writer. Um, the one sort of half exception is that in our very first piece, um, there was an elaborate, uh, uh, improvised uh, narrative that played out over the course of Master Builder that I, I was half of. So I, could, I was sort of making that text and also performing it. Uh, but usually I'm just performing the text. But you have this interesting, you know, in the long rehearsal process, you are both performer and writer at the same time, which must be so complicated for me. It's complicated, but uh, we have James Gibbs, who's uh, the, the drum turk of the company, and not, not here right now, but um, and co-writer on uh, m many of the pieces. And so he's out there. and. You have, when you have to have consensus with yourself. Really, though. Like, uh, you, do you find yourself kind of warring oh, in I, identity? Completely, <laughs> completely, completely. And I, 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 I mean, when I'm standing here, I defer to Marianne and, and, you know, the people out there to guide what is happening here, because I can't really tell inside the machine. I have no idea what's going on. Because <laughs> I'm playing to a little camera like this, and there's not, I'm talking to someone that's not in front of me, and it's not like, you know, we're in a room and we're sitting on furniture and we're talking to each other, so I, I, I can't, yeah, I can't do that. But I am, you know, edit, in, in my head, I'm like going, okay, that's a terrible sentence, you know, like while it's coming out of my mouth. And so, right. it, yes, yes, of course. So we, we, we have a, there, because of shows, we have a hard stop at one, so I wanna take these last seven or eight minutes to, we have some questions, Q and A. Yeah. Hi, I was um, interested in like what are the stakes of dramaturgy? I know you guys are talking a lot about playwrights, and um, I, I would be interested to hear more about what media dramaturgy is, and then sort of what why is it important to have dramaturgy? Like what what is it that dramaturgs sort of provide?
Another thing about, another way this resembles a, an operating system is that you make the show and you put it out and it's like, it has so many bugs in it and the first time it goes out, people are like, what is that? And that doesn't work and this is crashing it. But eventually, you know, as you roll it out, you work out the bugs and, it, and ultimately it becomes a kind of a system that supports the show and is built into the show and becomes part of the company. And, and, you want and at the same time, I think that this, that uh, in terms of builders and other practices like it, this, if there are others, this is still uh, using the traditional skills of a dramaturg as well, um, in that all of these pieces, almost all of them, required an incredible amounts of historical research um, that, you know, that say James Gibbs might be as a dramaturg, but lots of people are working on a lot of primary material, you know, excavating different data systems, reading like, you know, 20 books on subjects on the subject at hand, uh, um, uh, arranging for interviews with, uh, with call center operators. I mean, that there is a real research practice behind every show that I would still think of as a dramaturgical practice um, in, in whatever sense, you know, someone might traditionally think about it as well. Questions? Well, with that, then I'm going to pick up on that drum jersey thing a little bit and ask you. Um, and to the operators, so kind of come in. Because it, 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 it's a very different actual model of drum jersey in the sense that it's an iterative drum jersey. And um, I thought that, you know, um, and then, and you, you, when, some people may not remember when Microsoft first launched, like, Windows 95, and it had bugs in it. And people were furious, because in the mid 90s, the notion of, le of launching and unfinished product was uh, radical. Yeah. The idea that something wouldn't be perfect and done when you bring it to market mm -hmm. is was radical and people freaked out. Mm -hmm. Now we're very um, acculturated to being part of the development process of products mm -hmm. when, you know, uh, and, and getting upgrades and stuff like that. So um, I don't know, I just feel like, like, it's, like you're proposing a different model of dramaturgy where it's mm -hmm. both the historical research but it's also this sense of like an evolving like mm -hmm. code checker. Right, exactly. Um, That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I guess that wasn't a question. <laughs> <laughs>